Welcome to Talking Giants, presented by John Boy Media. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. Good amount to get to. We got to talk about Marcus Golden being traded, mailbag voicemails. Anyways, Justin, how you doing, man? How was your How was your little bit of time off from uh, the Giants and and not having to record a podcast since Thursday night? It, it was nice. I missed you, Bobby Skinner. You know, it's been a while since we talked in, in front of a microphone together. I missed you. I missed our Patreon chat. I missed uh, I missed the world. I did. But it was nice to watch football this weekend. There was a ton of good games on. There was a ton of good action, I mean, especially that Sunday night game. I forced myself to stay up for that Sunday night game, and I'm so glad that I did. It was just nice to watch football. And I'm not even saying as like a, a petty Giants fan where I'm like, uh, it was so great not to watch the Giants and suffer. No, it was just nice to watch all of football and not be bogged down by, okay, after the one o'clock game is over, we have to rewatch the game. We have to look at the stats. Then we have to record. And then all I want to do is go to bed. It was nice. And we're going to have it again this weekend since we play on Monday night. For sure. It really was. Um, how are you? How are you? How are you? I'm doing good, man. Good. Like I said, took some time off, went to the beach for a couple of days, which is nice, which is, I always enjoy that. I watch the new Borat movie and I'll, I'll say, heard of his I w- yeah, I, and I, w- it's a sequel. He's older. I wasn't expecting it to be good, but I'll say as someone who I Borat honestly was so before his time, it was a hilarious movie. Ollie G show was cr- like, just even though like the Borat scenes, like Ollie G was good. Like my the Ollie G was the vet, the he goes to a farm, a veterinarian farm where the veterinarian's a former veteran too, or I guess once a veteran, always a veteran. He's a veteran too, mm. and that's like some of the funniest stuff. And like the whole Borat was like the first video movie was so real. I mean, he got sued by basically everybody on there, and this one was just fake. And it, like I got a, you know some chuckles here and there, but it was just fake and it sucked. Like I I I really did hate it. It's too Hollywood. Yeah, it just, it just was like I get you have to have some script of stuff in it, but you just everything was fake. Like the people they were living with was fake. Everything about it was fake. But I did enjoy the beach. It was nice to get away, um, spend some time in the sun. It was good. I always enjoy getting out there. So nonetheless, it was. What was that bird eating? You posted a video on social media of a bird eating something. A fish. It was eating a fish. Okay. Yeah. You weren't yeah. clear about that, and I couldn't see. Sun was very strong. Yes, very strong. And I was, I, you know, now that I'm not working on the sun, I go and fry myself. That's right. All right, Justin, this episode was brought to you by five people. Five people. Besides John Boy Media, brought to us by Perry Gordon. Perry Gordon. Freddie Goodall. Um, so that reminds me of Freddie Adu. Freddie Goodall has been a long time listener. I think, I mean, like, you know, like 2019 draft early. I'm pretty wow. sure I could be wrong. David Tebley. I think I got his name wrong. He's he's from the YouTube trout. He's been a. I actually I I did a stream with David on with Entertainer. So he's a he's a good dude. Kevin Stott, yeah. Stott. Mm. He's from um, he's Germany. from London. He's from London. Oh. The down under. That's your that's your accent. That's it. From the down under, shrimp on the barbie. No, oh, nice. Now we're, I love how us Americans we always switch the british english and australian accents we just we just don't know the difference it, it always infuses one into the other all the time there was a while where my dad and his like main employee they just kept on using australian accents and they, was, they just kept on saying my and then huh. they were getting they're getting swamped with business so he started answering the phone for like like clean cut tree service my huh. what can we do you for um and then See, the last half, one, half of that was australian the other half i feel like was british yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> they're close, aren't they? Um, no, probably. I don't know. <laughs> then the last one is this guy, Stefan Pennick. You know oh. this guy? You know this St- cat? Um, no relation to me. No. Um, Stephen Pennick is my father. He's been a longtime listener of uh, Bleeding Blue and Talking Giants. I think it took him a little while to listen to Bleeding Blue. I think it took him a little while. Don't know if he was a pure day one. Um, I guess uh, I guess I needed to really show that I was doing it for him to really invest in it. So, uh yeah, but patreon.com backslash talking giants. Those people, including somebody who's related to me blood wise, they went to that website and they put down their credit card information. And for $2 a month, you can get access to watching the podcast live. 
Um, earlier this week, I posted my Evan Ingram blog a couple hours early, so the patrons got access to that. Um, and you get uh, access to even some monthly shirt raffles that magnets. we are doing. And stickers or, or magnets, very nice magnets as well. They are very nice. They go right on your car, refrigerator, or your ass. Patreon.com backslash Talking Giants. All right, Justin, we got a good amount to get to. We got voicemails to go to, but we got to start. I know it's been some time, but let's start with Marcus Golden. Friday afternoon, I mean, right after the game, basically, the Giants trade him away for a six-round pick back to Arizona. Uh, I've been saying it. Lorenzo Carter, or sorry, Lorenzo Carter, Marcus Golden was still the best pass rusher on this Giants team. Now, he wasn't versatile, so he didn't fit into what Graham was doing, but he was still the best pass rusher. They just they didn't see him fitting in. They move on from him, um, Justin. But I do like I'll, I'll kick it to you and we'll we'll talk about it. But I did just per snap rate and compared 2019 to 2020 tackles uh, are way off. 2019 he has 72. This year would have been 53 at that rate. Sacks 10 to eight. Tackles for a loss 13 to 11. QB hits it, it, a pace for four more 30, 27 to 31, and then wow. pressures 44 to 42. Wow. He was doing the same stuff. He just wasn't getting reps, which I get. I mean I'm. I really am at a point as like with at, with my Giants fandom as in Patrick Graham I trust. I really do. Uh, I know people think because we're off on Garrett or I'm off on Garrett kind of early, people are like, "Oh, you just you just hate hate hate." No, it's like I I fully trust Patrick Graham. When there's something I disagree with, I just be like, "Oh, I I know he knows a lot better than me." Um so but nonetheless they move on from him and uh I'm I'm happy to see him go and go somewhere where I believe he'll be used. Yeah. Yeah, um, you made that little you, – you put together that little tweet. And why I think his tackle rate is lower is simply because he's not being used on running downs and he's been used as a as a solely a pass rusher, which honestly he was used – he was a three-down player for us last year in 2019. So, of course, he was going to you know rack up the tackles, but he was also getting the pass rushing opportunities. So those two things were kind of the same from 2019 to 2020 and the fact that he would have been on a higher pace if he was getting the same amount of snaps um that's bananas and he had an insane year last year like it was it was top 15 edge rusher in the national football league in terms of qb hits pressures things like that and it was because he got a lot of reps but i'm not going to fault somebody for putting up good performances and he he wasn't an elite pass rusher but People who are like, oh, it's coverage sacks. And I, I, we, I've said this line 20 times. So people are probably hearing like, oh, here he's saying the same thing again. If he could get 10 coverage sacks with last year's coverage, which is some of the worst in the league, then my gosh, like imagine what he could have done this year, you know? And, you know, yeah. And it seemed like he was getting there. He just wasn't involved in the game plan. He got forced in a little bit once Carter and Zimenez went down, but even then they weren't using him a ton. I mean, so, um, but I'm happy for him. I know he's a guy you like a lot. I like a lot. He's somebody that you just genuinely root for. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, his family's been good to you. He's a good dude. And I, I really can't wait to see him play in Arizona. Yeah. He deserves to go out and try and get whatever kind of contract he can get as he gets into his 30s. Because I yeah. believe that he is 30, 31 this year. 29. 29. So once you get on the plus side of 30, you know, your career trajectory isn't exactly up. And I think he very much knows that he deserves to go and have an opportunity where he can try and get paid. And hopefully it's by Arizona because they seem to like him. Good guy, great family. Um, not just a good guy because he had a 10 sack season. He was a good guy, you know, from day one when he signed, he was really well liked Bobby. We were talking about before the season of him possibly becoming a captain and that wasn't a stretch. So Glad the Giants got something from him. I think Dan Duggan was speculating where he was talking with some people that, you know, because pass rushers, you know, you always need more pass rushers in this league. Could have possibly gotten a fifth rounder for for him, but six rounds, fine. If you're not going to use them, then getting a six round pick isn't the worst thing in the world. And the Giants need more picks. They don't have a ton of picks um, this, this coming of this upcoming NFL draft. No, their fifth is gone because of Leonard Williams and their seventh is gone because Isaac Yedem. Um, so yeah, I mean, happy, happy for him. Mm -hmm. Um, other news before we get to mailbag, DJ douche, DJ lughead, 
posting videos on his Instagram of our guys, Jones, Saquon, reportedly Victor and Mac, even though it's hard to see. And then supposedly Shepard was there too. Yeah. This was a huge, made a huge deal. Um, basically my thought on it was like, Hey, like I get that they're on a big stage and stuff, but you, do you go to a job? Have you been out a time or two? Um, it seemed like it actually was private. That wasn't just like a, a dumb, lo- like, you know, them covering their ass. It, it seemed like uh, it was like, hey, it was, they were private with the DJ, you know, um, and, you know, a couple other people. It's not going to be just them, but uh, I'm sure there'll be some kind of fine. But overall, I really think this is kind of a non story. Yeah. Very similar to what I said about the whole post Golden Tate fight thing. It can kind of suck to be a celebrity where you are under such a microscope where these guys, you know, they go out to whether it was a private event, it, it wasn't. And whether they're saying that to cover, I don't know. I don't care. Frankly, when I saw that that news happened on Saturday morning, it was a good excuse for me to not tweet about the giants that day. So I didn't, I pretty much <laughs> didn't. It was a nice, I was like, Oh, so this is going to be what, what everybody's talking about today. This is a great excuse to not talk about the giants. Um, it sucks that like, I'm not, being filmed everywhere you know everywhere that i may go and somebody may recognize me somebody's not going to take out their phone and take a picture of me or take a video of me so uh that's kind of like a nice thing that i can do about going about living my life and they don't have that advantage so that's that you know that's i mean that, think but about I have this a- slayton tweeted out like there's like hey what's the best you know seafood like crab place in new jersey new york so like he's going out you know like no one had an issue with that. <laughs> so yeah, anyways, but, you know, who, a, who, who cares? Like, honestly, it's a personal thing, whether you're, you know, it's, it's, this is all a personal thing about your views on this, how comfortable you're going out. And I could care less about that. But the take that I was thinking of, and the thing that I was thinking about pretty much all weekend, you know, and depending on what came out about this situation, where they supposed to be out, is this in violation of COVID policies and NFLPA rules? Because I guess that's that that could be a valid conversation to have. Was this in violation? I don't know. But Joe Judge benched Andrew Thomas for almost an entire quarter for being late to a Saturday team meeting. Not not missing the Saturday team meeting. He was a couple minutes late. So if they were if these guys were in violation of pretty much the one thing they can't do, and they can't be seen. I mean, they they can go out and they can do it, but they can't be seen doing it. If they were in violation at, what would the punishment be? You're going to start Colt McCoy? You're going to bench Sterling Shepard? No. You know, that, that, was, that was the thing that was going through my head, that this was going to be a huge test for Joe Judge um, about going forward, about how he's going to handle the discipline and how he's going to handle all this. But I guess handling it internally is a way to just cover all that up so he doesn't have to deal with all those questions. Oh, you benched Andrew Thomas, so why aren't you going to bench Daniel Jones and Sterling Shepard? Yeah. All right. Let's, let's, uh, who cares? Who let's, cares? Who let's, cares? uh, on that note, let's kick it to Steve. Mail time. Mail time. The mail's here. Come on. Bye, guys. Here's the mail. It never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. All right. Thanks, Steve from Blues Clues. Justin. Let's get into the mail. I believe we have a voicemail from frequent frequent flyer caller Dan from Staten Island. Dan from he called right after the game, so I figured we put him on first. This is a long. I one. had to call uh, right after that that game. It's uh, that. Dan from Staten Island, New York. What's going on, talking Giants? I think we're at a point now where we have to get rid of Evan Ingram. I'm done. I'm completely done with him, all right? We tried getting him involved in the offense. Daniel Jones throws a perfect ball to him to seal the game, get a field goal to make it an eight-point game, and he drops it. I know it wasn't, like, perfectly in his hands, but he just had enough of his fingertips on it to grab it, and he drops it. And this guy's supposed to have great hands, right? You know, I, I remember when he got drafted, they said he had amazing hands, yeah my ass uh Oof. defense did all right yeah we let go of the touchdowns there's a lot of questionable calls throughout this game for example the pass interference call on james bradbury on that game winning drive for philadelphia very questionable in my opinion uh the logan ryan shove that was 
come on, you got to do better than that. That's on Logan Ryan. I'm not blaming that on the referees. Uh, this offensive line needs to improve too. They, we can't just let Daniel Jones get sacked that easily. And also, it's also on Daniel Jones because he fumbled again. I think this is like the fourth game he's fumbled. I don't, I don't know how many times he's fumbled, but I don't know. I'm happy that Shepard did good. Uh, Wayne Gallman looked good. Uh, Deion Lewis avenged himself. Uh, we should have won this game. All right. I don't know what else to say. Go Giants. All right. Thank you, Dan, from Staten Island, from calling in with that just that raw emotion. I love it. Justin. You wrote a blog about Evan Ingram. You made a video about Evan Ingram. You've been doing your Evan Ingram research. I'm going to kick it to you. What kind of bring that all, bring that all in? I'm going to Quentin Tarantino win, and I'm going to start from the end, and then I guess we'll go back to the beginning. The Giants, in my opinion, my opinion, they're probably not going to do it. The Giants need to reduce the snaps of Ed. Daniel Jones in New York which we hope that there is. If there's any hope for this 2020 season, the Giants need, 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 need to reduce the snaps of Evan Ingram. Daniel Jones has thrown four interceptions this year. I'm sorry, no. Daniel Jones has thrown seven interceptions this year. Evan Ingram has been targeted on four of them. There have been a fump. There's, there was the Cisco where he got two hands on it, but it's counted as a, in the box score, it's counted as a Daniel Jones fumble. And then include this weekend or this Thursday night where I do count in my brain as a, as just a way to hold skill position players accountable. If they drop a ball on third and fourth down and it leads to a direct change of possession, I also count that as a turnover. So make that six turnovers, one being a drop pass, six turnovers that Evan Ingram has been in, overall involved in this year. And there's some advanced analytics and advanced stuff that measures how effective players are. And Evan Ingram is historically bad. Bobby, he has around a 30 passer rating when targeted from Daniel Jones this year. 30. And this isn't some ESPN QBR where it's tough to get a a good score out of 100. No, this is the 158.3 where guys can have sometimes a pretty crappy game and still get a 90 passer rating. They need to reduce his snaps because at this point, force-feeding Evan Ingram the ball is costing the team more than it is helping. It is harming the team tremendously and is impeding Daniel Jones' success. It's impeding the offensive success. Yeah, and you know we'll talk about Garrett in a, in a bit, but he used Evan Ingram the way we've been begging. I mean, we went from mad at Evan Ingram to start the season to literally feeling bad for him, feeling bad for him. He's dejected because he's not being used the right way. Garrett used him the way that he should in drags, fade ball, like and and those ways. Those are the ways you get Evan Ingram involved, and he was involved in this game. It wasn't why stick, why stick, and he just lets us down. A, a drop turning into an interception, that drop there, man. And honestly, I think that dude, he just need. I I think he can go somewhere and be successful, but he needs a change of scenery. Like it's just, it just seems like it's not going to happen here. And I know you brought up like. I've, I, I would go back to those first four games of 2019 and be like, but look how freaking productive he was, you know, like two games over 100 yards and touchdowns. But then it's like, that's kind of the outlier. Like those four games are the outlier for Evan Ingram. So, yeah. Yeah. And also, I kind of uncovered a piece of this Evan Ingram conversation that no one has been talking about. And I kind of uncovered it. Say what you want about Eli Manning being checked down Charlie and not being a great quarterback his, his final couple of years. Eli Manning made Evan Ingram a pretty darn good football player. And particularly the one stat that sticks out to me is the yards after the catch. Because what do we want Evan Ingram to do? And what has been the whole argument for how to use Evan Ingram? It's, it's the using him in space. And his strength is supposed to be the yards after the catch. The difference between... Eli Manning, Evan Ingram and Eli Manning's yards after after catch number and Daniel Jones and Evan Ingram's yards after catch number, it's about three yards. It's about three yards greater with Eli Manning. And these were both years under Shermer. I'm not even counting 2020. You know, 2018 and then 2019, basically if you split those two things up and 2017 too, 
the yards after catch was three yards greater with Eli Manning. So it's clear for whatever reason that Daniel Jones and Evan Ingram do not have a good connection. I'm not saying bench Evan Ingram. I'm saying use him situationally, use him down the seam, use him down the sideline. Bobby, there was even a second and five play where J.C. Garrett ran this weekend where Ingram was lined up in the backfield. Then right before the ball was snapped, Ingram was put in motion and they threw a little bubble screen to him. The offensive line, they moved left. So the linebackers, they moved right as they moved right with the offensive line. So then it gave Evan Ingram a little bit of space to get five yards after the catch, after catching the ball in the backfield. Using Evan Ingram in that way, great. Force feeding him the ball as a natural tight end. We can't afford to do it anymore because it is hurting Daniel Jones. It's literally hurting Daniel Jones' chances chances of staying in New York. Quick. Now, it seems like the Giants aren't going to trade him unless they get something like a third. I actually agree with that because his trade value in the offseason, it's as low as it can be right now. And I'm not saying that like we need to keep like we can't get we can't move on from this guy but i do agree of waiting till the offseason to trade him if you're not getting a good offer i really he, he i really do what about what do you think yeah i i agree i i don't know you know the thing the, the the thing that's most frustrating is i really wish i was in the room with the arizona cardinals right I really wish I was in the room. What's another team that's competing that can maybe use a, a tight end? Can the Bills use a tight end? I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it, in, insert another team here that can use a tight end and use a weapon like Evan Ingram. Those teams that feel like they can go for it, they may give up something. Now, was the Jordan Ronan report or Ian Rappaport, whoever put out reports this week, that Evan Ingram is not on the trade block? Was that a smokescreen by the Giants? And that's smart. And they're trying to get teams to bump up their bump up their offer, or was it typical Giants uh, Giants you know the Giants way of the organization never executes smoke screens and pretty much when things are leaking out of the organization they're pretty much spot on. I'm hoping it's the former rather than the latter. Yeah, and honestly, like you said, there's teams that are going for it right now in the off season. A lot more teams are going for it. You know what I mean? And you have an off season to incorporate because Ingram is a different type of player where you can't just plug and play him. So it gives you an off season to incorporate. And honestly, yeah, my, I go back to Olivier Vernon. Could you have got a six round pick for Olivier Vernon that, that year? Probably. But in the off season, you get a team like the Browns that is trying to come and win now. And they're like, you know what? We need someone opposite of miles Garrett. And they, they believe they believe this and you trade a Kevin Zeitler for him. So that's why I'm for waiting for the off season because honestly, He's probably got the most value. He's young. He's he is a weapon. I know we're we're hating him right now, but you cannot tell me there's not a team that's no. going to look at him and think they could change him. I mean, look at hell. Look at Vernon Davis with the 49ers. He was a bust. He was a freak athlete. He gets with the right coaching staff, and and that's what kind of sucks. The drops are an issue. You know, a lot of it is him, and a lot of Vernon Davis's issues were him too. So, but what I'm saying is, in the off season. I do think there'll be more value for him and there's no need to rush him out. Cause it's, it's not like he's ex- his deals expiring at the end of the year. He had, that's yeah. the fifth year option. So there's no need to rush him out. Right. And my whole thing with limiting his snaps, this isn't like crapping on Evan Ingram. This isn't crapping on Daniel Jones. It's definitely a little crapping on Jason Garrett, but it's just the situation. Cause Bobby, you know, sometimes it's just as simple as, looking with your eyes and you know obviously he has all the all the talent and all the potential in the world which we've been saying that for four or five years now has all the potential and talent in the world but there comes a point where we just need to see Daniel Jones throwing Evan Ingram the ball and forcing him the ball is hurting the football team more than it is helping that's where I'm at this that's the simple point where I'm at where we cannot be force feeding him the ball it's not like oh Evan Ingram sucks Jones sucks it's just that observation, and that needs to change. That's where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100%. We got uh, one more voicemail about the tight end position. Let me find it, find it, find it. Here we go. Bobby, what's up, man? This is Mike calling from Jersey. Jersey Mike's. I have a question for you guys. Why isn't Caden Smith involved more in this offense? 
I just want to try to understand this. We see Evan Ingram struggle. We see him go out there, miss blocks, drop balls. Why is Caden Smith getting one target a game? I feel like he had a good connection with Jones last year, and now he's invisible. Guys, can shed some light on that? Justin, um, Caden Smith seemed like a security blanket for Daniel Jones. And honestly, he reminds me of Swain, um, the tight end at Duke, where it was like he'd find that, like the check down. Jones likes to check down towards the middle of the field more than he does the running back, you know, where some QBs, it's like, bam, bam. All right, I'm hitting the running back in the swing. Jones is more of a like, bam, bam, find the tight end in the middle of the field and finding, you know, him finding a hole in zone. So, and Caden Smith has been, a halfway decent blocker. He's been used as a fullback, which is kind of crazy, um, which I think the Giants should invest in a fullback in this offseason. I said it last season. Elijah Penny's just not a good fullback. He's a converted tailback. But nonetheless, he's a he's a much better blocker than Ingram. Um, but with Ingram on the field, I know you're saying reduced snaps. They are not going to play Caden Smith as the number one tight end. It's just – it's not going to happen. I don't understand why, you know, uh, frankly, what I, th- what I think I- I'm asking for, and we're not going to get it. I know we're not going to get it. What I'm asking for is use Caden Smith as your more conventional tight end. And then simply bring in Evan Ingram for passing downs. I mean, fr- and if you remember, Bobby, that's what I kind of said over the summer. And that's what we thought the plan would maybe be. Evan Ingram, the first few games of the season was getting 90% of the snaps. Now, granted, Jason Garrett was also running a lot of 13 personnel, so all three tight ends were getting a lot of snaps because that's the personnel packages we were using, and it's gone down since then for Evan Ingram to around the low the low 80s, but still that's too much. And Cadence, and we're talking about chemistry and connection between skill position player and quarterback. It just seems that Caden Smith has a little bit more of a connection with Daniel Jones than Evan Ingram and Daniel Jones. Yeah, I want to see him play some tight end one reps. It's, uh, I mean, they seem to have something nice there. You know, that Philly game week 17 was awesome for Caden Smith. Yeah. You know, he had the two touchdowns versus Washington. I mean, he seemed to have, like, even the Packers game, he had some, you know, some decent, some really good blocking in that game. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a good chance Caden Smith is the starting ten, tight end next season but with Evan Ingram on the roster I understand it but he's just not going to get the, mo- the majority of the reps he's not going right. to get a ton of reps either as the starting tight end all right we got um a a mailbag question and a voicemail we'll do the voicemail first this is um our guy Zach hey guys this is Zach from Chesapeake Virginia calling for, from my house I keep seeing a lot of things regarding Dave Gettleman being fired due to his inability to put together a decent roster. And while not a, I'm not a homer, I don't see him going anywhere. Because I, I see his success in finding a franchise quarterback and long-term head coach and judge outweigh some of the misses that he's had so far in his tenure. And I think most haters discount the fact that he came in to a situation with no cap space, terrible coaches, and expensive contracts. And he, has, he spent you know his first two years fixing that while he was beholden Demarius wishes to let Eli finish off strong, you know. So I, I just don't see Dave Gettleman as the problem, and I think that the owners uh, need to step aside and let him actually run things by consistently stepping in. What are you guys' thoughts? Uh, do you see him going anywhere at the end of the season, or do you see his timer being reset with uh, the acquisition of Judge? Thanks. And go Big Blue. And then we have a mailbag. Mailbag from Tim Coffey. Tell me why I'm crazy for thinking that Gettleman is staying. I think that admin administration wants he and Judge to have a complete and normal offseason together. Am I wrong in thinking that Judge may have more pull in year two on personnel slash evaluation? Now, I have something to say about this, but do you want to go first? I'll go. And I'm not a Dave Gettleman hater. I mean, me and Danny did an episode at the end of last year, like just grading the moves, and I had him as above average. But here's the issue, man, is that, you know, you can say injuries, but at some point you have to build depth, and we don't have any depth. Yeah. Sterling Shepard goes down, this team's screwed. Lorenzo Carter, Zimmon is to go down, this team's screwed. You know, Darnay Holmes, a fourth-round pick, he, like, he, he gets screwed. I don't know. What are you mouthing at me? Say it. What I'm basically mouthing at you is – Dave Gettleman has had three years 
Okay. He's had three years to at least build depth. And I kind of said this on Thursday, but why is it that when Tay Crowder, the last pick of the 2020 NFL draft, Darnay Holmes, a fourth round cornerback rookie from the 2020 draft, why is it that when these guys go out, Adrian Colbert, who was off of the scrap heap of another football team. Now, obviously, you can include Xavier McKinney. It hurts. DeAndre Baker hurts. Gettleman is at fault at that for that a little bit, but mostly not. Yeah. Beal hurts. I get all that. But the defense was looking promising in the middle of the season. Why is it now that when we lose those three, four pieces that were all acquisitions from 2020 and not high leverage acquisitions, might I add, why is it that we have no depth behind them? Gentlemen, at three years, and to Zach's voicemail, the most important of Zach, the most important part of Zach's voicemail, while I disagree with the large majority of it, well, the most important part of Zach's voicemail is until John Maris steps up to the microphone, which he will never say, until he steps behind a microphone and he says, you know, it was really me that orchestrated the whole one more less hurrah for Eli Manning. That's on me. Until, but he's not going to do it. But until John Mara admits his involvement in the organization and just how involved he is, we kind of have to put it on the general manager. I agree. We have I, to, right? I really don't like the idea of being like, we do too much guessing, like being like, oh, Judge was the one that ran this draft. Like, how the hell do you know that? Like, what? Like, we got to stop guessing on who's involved. Like, like he's the GM. Until, like you said, until Mara says, like, hey, I forced him to do that, and these are the moves I forced on him then we have to put it on the general manager. And like you yeah. said, it's the middle of the year three. We're rebuilding and we're selling parts off right now. We're selling yeah. parts off. We're, Kevin yeah. Zeitler is a good player. He hasn't been perfect this year, but he's a good player. And we're thinking about selling him off. We're selling, you know, trying to sell Ingram off. So I'm not like, you know, I'm not, I don't think I even view myself as a Gelman hater, but at some point we do have to play the results and be like, hey, we have been the worst team in the league the last three years. Yeah. You know, and, and, you the and the fact that, and the fact, and I, and I know Zach, Zach's not the only person that thinks this, the, the idea that he didn't have a lot of cap room. He went out and he signed to Nate Solder, which was the most expensive contract ever given to an offensive lineman. He went out and he stopped in Stort for four and a half million dollars for one year. He went out and he signed Patrick Omame to a three-year deal. So the idea that he didn't have cap room and things to maneuver around the cap is always One year bad cap always room. something it is the cap is always something that you can maneuver and move around to still make moves it's always something yeah. so i never got that ex and also acquiring alec ogletree the alec ogletree contract yeah and you know like we you know not every gm is going to have you know there's going to be bad moves but at some point you it do took, have it to took them two years Took him two years to make good moves. But what I'm that's saying my, is, at some point, issue. at some point, you do have to play the results. Um, and I don't think Joe Judge is a reason to keep. Like, this is why I and, and repeat said, either fire Pat Shermer and Dave Gelman or keep Pat Shermer and Dave Gelman. I was open to right. both. Like, I was, I wasn't against either one of those decisions. I honestly leaned as keep both. I really did. Um, but now it's like I, Joe Judge. I like Joe Judge. I think he's a teacher. I think he's detailed. But he's one in six. And I'm not saying this is totally his fault. But also, like, as much as we love Patrick Graham and Joe Judge is the head coach, and he has let Jason Garrett come in and put this offense. And like it's not it's not like Joe Judge comes in and like, okay, you do the offense, man. We'll we'll talk here and there. They work and they install stuff. And a lot of that is on Joe Judge. And that was my one of my biggest criticisms of Pat Shermer. Is like you're the head coach, dude. You need to be involved in the defense somehow. You don't need to call plays, me drawing a scheme, but you need to know what their philosophy is on a week in, week out basis. And maybe he did. And I guess, and that was one of the reasons I was kind of like, that was one of my biggest negatives on Shermer. So he is the head coach. He has impact on that. It's not simply just, all right, you go play with the offense, Jason Garrett, you go play with the Pat defense, Patrick Graham, I'll call timeouts. That's not how being a head coach works when you, when you're in that role. So right. Joe judge hasn't done anything to, Say we got to bring him back, and that's my view: is let the new GM, if do whoever they bring in, do whatever they want. You guys know I love Daniel Jones. I believe in Daniel Jones, but the new GM should not have prerequisites. There should be no prerequisites of you have to keep Judge and you have to keep Daniel Jones. Hire who you think is the best man for the job, and let him do his job. Because now 
what you're just criticizing the last thing for happening for like, oh, well, we can't really blame him because Merrick, you know, forced Eli and, and this. We're doing the same thing exactly. over again. Yep. We're doing the same thing over again. So it's not – I don't feel like this is anti-Joe, like, Gettleman really because there's some moves I do like a Gettleman. I think he gets – he has – like, people have hated him from the beginning. I haven't. But at some point, you have to play the results. Yeah. Yeah, you can like individual players and you can like individual moves and even if you like a few of them. But I hate to bring this out there and I hate to be this kind of podcast. We're going to move on after this. There has not been a single team in the National Football League the last three years that has won less games than the New York Football Giants. So that's that's tough. So Yeah, at some right, point you have to play the results. Obviously, there's 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 nuance to it. And like I said, this isn't, you know, I wasn't calling for Dave Gettleman before. Actually, I kind of was because I was like, if they're going to fire Shermer, they need to fire Gettleman. Right. But right. I, th- this isn't coming from someone who's like, oh, you know, fire Gettleman for the last three years. I haven't been like that. And I've been, honestly, I've been mostly positive on a lot of stuff. But at some point, you do have to play the results and yeah. realize like, hey, we're two, three injuries on the defense and, are, and we're just, we're screwed. So, and we're in a horrible division. All right. <laughs> Next, we got a, a mailbag question from our guy, Bro- yes. Brian Porras. Duke gang. Brian, Brian Porras at B Porras 1. I don't give up on rookie left tackles after a few games, but what would be wrong with rotating and pair at left tackle for two to three series per game? Supports depth, gets pair more game experience, and if done judiciously, doesn't destroy Thomas's confidence, which you could even make an argument right now. That Andrew Thomas conf- Andrew Thomas's confidence is kind of pretty low already. Yeah, it, you know, basically, if you want Parrot to play, let him come in and play right tackle and let him play. Not one series where he gives up a sack on four snaps. And I, you know, I pointed some things out in the O line report that listen, this is the stuff I said. Let's 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 cool it on on Parrot. But nonetheless, um, I don't even like I, this. Isn't like. Like eventually Thomas may have to move the right tackle if it doesn't, if it doesn't work out, but rotating them, you got to play one at the one at one spot, one at the other. I think Parrot played his entire college at right tackle. Um, Andrew Thomas played his entire time at college at left tackle. Andrew Thomas was better than him against better competition. So I don't think Matt Parrot is better than Andrew Thomas. Um, but right now I am totally cool with playing Thomas at left start paired at right. I think Parrot has shown enough to where he wouldn't be a total disaster where it's like, oh, we got to bring back Cam Fleming. So I'm cool with giving Parrot reps. That might be something they're doing this week because they had, you know, 11 days off compared to last week where it was on a short week. Um, I have no clue what that is, but I'm not for the idea of rotating those two. There's no point of rotating those two. Was it Joe Thomas, the ex-offensive lineman that said, it's almost like wiping your your hindquarters with the opposite hand, playing left tackle and right tackle. It was some former offensive lineman. So I'm going to invite you, Brian Porres, you, Brian Porres specifically, to switch every couple days, wiping with your left hand and wiping with your right hand, and let me know how that goes for you. Well, Brian, is, to Brian's point, he's not saying to move Thomas over the right. He's saying to just rotate those two. No, left. but that's what I'm saying. If you want to just move them around and if you want to just, you know, especially pair, we, we would be moving around pair, really. You, you give pair two to three series. But when you're practicing tackle. as a swing tackle, it's a little more easier because you're practicing yeah, both every day. I, I was just saying, I was just coming up with the but on, But I do agree. Try wiping with the other hand. Everybody, not just Brian Porras. Everybody, <laughs> next time you wipe, wipe with the other hand. I'm take a picture. Take a picture of what it looks like afterwards no, on your no. hand. I, we do some. We ask for some weird stuff. I'm not asking for that. Do not do that. I will block your ass if you do that. I will. I won't block you. I'll, I'll, I'll say nice, nice job. <laughs> All right, we got a a couple more mailbag questions. Yeah, um, this is from uh, the name is underscore, but at zero hot dog zero. What are the chances Garrett is fired after the year? Personally, I think Thursday Night Football was his best game, but he still has to go. I think he's the biggest problem on offense. Also, what are some future potential offense coordinator candidates? I like Mike LaFleur from San Fran. LaFleur. LaFleur. It's um, Matt LaFleur's brother. Oh, I I thought so. And there's another one too. I'll let you go. I'll let... I'll let you go with, oh, there is another mailbag. Yes, I'm sorry. There is from 
Yas. Yas. Yas at Yas. Yasin. Yasin Yas Manhood. Queen. Speaking of Yas Queen, do you see Annie Apple blocked me today? What the hell was that, Annie? Oh, nice. Nice. Well, she said because Eli Apple got cut. Shocker. Blown away. I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that that has Giants happened. should think about it. But she said to, and I wasn't trolling her. She said to all the trolls in your mention, I pray that you go and use your energy wiser, go out and vote. And I quote tweeted, I said, great idea, Annie. And posted our, like, vote for Bobby Skinner. We got your endorsement. And she blocked me. I didn't say nothing bad about Eli. And I'm, I'm, tw- I'm, I'm tweeting a vote Bobby Skinner, Justin Pennock tweet right now. All right, it went through. Let me go back to let me go back to the mailbag questions from Yas. I had to tweet it out. I forgot to tweet it out. So Yas's question, it's probably about Jason Garrett. And it is. What did you make of Jason Garrett's calling on offense against Philadelphia? Seemed to me he opened up the playbook a little bit. Would you put that down to Garrett or the return of Shep? I don't know if he opened up the play. How do we define opening up the playbook? Yeah, I think. You know, from the TV copy, I was like, oh, there's some good stuff. And there was some good stuff he did, working routes. Like, I will say it was better. I know people like played like, oh, the Dallas game, he called a good game. He really didn't. But there was some better stuff. But overall, man, I just – I know Garrett, who he is, he has a philosophy. It might get better as the year goes along. But I, it would have to be a total change for me. And it wasn't like he was doing anything crazy. You know, it wasn't like any new concept. It was some basic stuff, which Jones is good at. Like, that – you know, that – um. Ingram drop. We ran that same play on a third down earlier game just to the opposite side of the field. Like, that's a good route. It's three routes working off each other. The back routes are like, it's a, it's a good concept because it's got Joan reading one, two, three guys. But it, it's it's an easy read for a big play or or a quick first down. So definitely some stuff I like. And Shepard does make a difference because he can get separation and he's a very good route runner. Um, But yeah, overall, I just... I would have to see a lot more to be convinced that Garrett's the guy. Um, I I was the people who were like, oh, we got to go get someone new and fresh and young. I was kind of always against that. I, I wasn't against that, but I was like, you don't just get someone young. But I am leaning towards that. Like, you know what? We need someone that's new and innovative. Like, I like Jay Gruden, yeah. but um, even him, I'd be like, you know what? It's kind of, you know, is he going to be the best offense coordinator in the NFL? I don't, I don't think so. So, like, why not go out and try and swing for some young – college oc like joe brady or somebody somebody somebody's name we don't even know you know cliff kingsbury's name wasn't in the hat you know um to start the year before he got fired at texas tech um so go out and take a chance i that's that's my my way of viewing this take take a chance don't go for safe hires go for take a chance hires and that's what patrick graham was i mean look at patrick graham his the dolphins defense sucked people were crapping on him and i think he's a genius like in Patrick Graham, I trust. So take a chance. Don't just get. I'm I'm kind of out on the retread hires. Yeah, I think if the season were to end today and the last three games of the Giants' season were Dallas, Washington, which was a win, and Philadelphia, I think Jason Garrett stays because I think oh the offense is headed in a good direction, even though we would be tremendously frustrated with that. Um, my problem is. The NFL is about explosive plays. The NFL is not about holding the ball. While while this is, in a way, this is how the Giants team is designed to win the time of possession battle and to keep the defense off the field, keep the offense on the field, because we put so much investment at running back with Barkley, but especially with the offensive line, that's the design. The Giants to hold on to the ball, but still the lack of explosive plays that happens on this offense, not even explosive plays like the golden Tate touchdown or the Darius Slayton touchdown week one, where it's 30, 40 plus yards down the field and it's ending in a touchdown. I still consider explosive plays 10 plus yards in the run game on a particular play or 15 plus yards in the passing game. That is in my brain, what I consider to be an explosive. And that is just so missing on this offense and at good NFL teams and good NFL offenses, maybe not 10 plus yard rushing gains, but they can consistently give you 15 yard passing plays consistently. They can do that. And the giants, every time they do that, we're jumping out of our seats because it's a miracle. 
that we're throwing the ball down the field. Guys are getting yards after the catch. Guys are getting wide open or somebody's just open down the field to begin with. So that's my main problem with this offense is that, yes, have they done a good job of maybe not punting the ball a ton this year? Have they done a good job of sustaining drives? But the lack of explosive plays to just jumpstart you, to put you on the opposite side of the 50, to put you in the red zone, that is non-existent. Alex Tanny, office, the chat is talking, the Patreon chat is talking about it. He is going to be a go, go be a coach somewhere. I can't wait to watch his career as a coach. Alex Tanny is going to be a good coach somewhere. All right, we got a voicemail. Hey, guys, it's Liam from calling from Princeton, New Jersey, in my house right now. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on maybe trading Jabril Peppers before the deadline? Now, hear me out a little bit. Um, we got Xavier McKinney coming back in about two weeks or so, uh, and we've seen him play at Alabama, and he plays a very similar role to what Jabril, player, uh, Jabril Peppers is playing in this defense now. And uh, I'm, I like Peppers a lot, but given that he's going to become a free agent soon and uh, McKinney's obviously a lot younger, uh, what are your guys' thoughts on trading Peppers and what do you think we could get from him? Thanks, guys. All right, I'll start, by the way. I was very happy with Peppers' game. I know that last touchdown we remembered, it was good coverage. Hell, I even watched the QB School, um, who's my new favorite YouTube channel, by the way, and he talked about that throw. And he's like, it's just a perfect throw. He's like... Like, there's nothing Peppers can do here. Like, this is good coverage. Um, but Peppers made plays. He had the sack. He forced an incompletion on a blitz. Um, he was fourth, good up in the run game. There was a fourth down. Wasn't there a fourth down or a third and it short? It was a third and he... one, and they got they got yeah. it on fourth down. But you see him blow past downs. Um, so I was happy with, with Peppers. That being said, no, Peppers is not somebody I want to trade. He's a good player. Um, don't bring up punt return stuff to me. He's a good player. I don't think we should be trading away good young players. And he's not going to – it's not like he's going to – we see the way the safety market is changing. He's not gonna. Need, he's not gonna get some huge contract, you know. Like he probably he's someone that would take like a probably a decent extension from the Giants. So no, I think Peppers is somebody we should extend. Um, and like we talked about before, we need depth. We need we need guys. And Logan Ryan, good chance he's not gonna be here next year. So we're gonna need McKinney. And McKinney can. I can't wait to see what Graham does with McKinney. But no, I. I'm 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 pretty against trading peppers unless it was for like a serious, like like a a day a day one a, a day two pick like not even I don't think I'd even trade him for a third rounder I, I wouldn't I would not trade him for a third rounder actually no, no, I'll be I'll be clear cut on that. A couple weeks ago I was saying I'd think about it, but now seeing Nate Ebner on the field and. We don't we don't exactly know when McKinney is coming back. Yes, we're hearing good things about how he's progressing. It was a foot injury. He hasn't done any conditioning since the summer. Most likely that involves, you know, him training with his legs or both of his legs. So I'm not rushing to bring McKinney back. I'm hoping the Giants aren't simply because they don't have a lot of depth at safety. Julian Love has not stepped up like we wanted to. Frankly, I don't think Julian Love is playing in the spot and in the role at which he's actually best at. And we previewed that over the summer, that my main fear was that Julian Love was going to be asked to play like a single high role. And that's not his strength. He is, he is more of an in-the-box, strong, strong safety like Jabril Peppers is. And when Adrian Colbert's hurt, that's where we've seen Julian Love. So, you know, there's a part of my brain that says, well, if you trade Jabril Peppers for a – very good offer, and you get a very good return because he also has 2021 because the fifth-year option, right? You you have that fifth-year option, so the value that you would get back for Peppers would be tremendous, hopefully, God willing, if you were to trade him, but they're not. Then Julian Love can go back to his natural spot at strong safety in the box. Logan Ryan could also be a third safety, and Adrian Colbert can be your deep center field safety. That would be the thought, and I'm not hating that, but losing Jabril Peppers would suck because we don't have the depth. No, but I thought Love played pretty decent, and he could be a depth piece. Um, and, like, give him time to grow. You know what I'm saying? Like, I thought Love played good in this last game. The week before, he didn't. This last game, he came up and made some plays in the past game, some stuff that doesn't get noticed. Um, played a ton of cover three, and it was like, did, like, he didn't really, like, you know, there was no time. It was like, damn, Julian Love screwed this up. So I was fine with the way Love actually played this past game, um, but but yeah, I, I can't wait to I can't wait to see what McKinney is like in this yeah. role. All right, next mailback question. 
next mailback question we have we actually got a few more yeah we got a few more while we're recording dylan singer at dylan singer with two r's for the draft should we go with more weapons for Daniel, like drafting Jamar Chase? Or should we get an edge rusher like Gregory Rousseau out of Miami who could add depth to our defense? I don't want Trevor because I feel like Daniel has had ups and downs, but is showing promise. Um, If Russo is supposed to be like the real deal pass rusher, it would be hard to pass up because a pass rusher would change the, this defense. It really would. Like, I think it could take this leaf defense with Blake Martinez, Bradbury, young guys just getting better and honestly turn it to an elite defense. If we had a, a pass rusher who's co- consistently getting there. Yep. I don't know if Russo's that. Um, we'll, you know, we'll spend more time in the offseason. I'm a big Jamar Chase fan. I think there might be there might be some receivers they go out and get in free agency, but I would not hate getting a receiver for our young quarterback. Waddle out of Alabama just went down. This past week. Just went down with the season-ending injury. So, Bobby, I'm kind of on this train of if we have a top-five pick – I kind of want to trade back and maybe get a wide receiver. That's where it's where I am today. That's where my brain is at today. If but we can it could trade change back, next week. If we can trade back, man, a trade back would be so good for this team. It really would. This team needs a trade back. It really does. Now, I hate when people are like, oh, we should just trade a pack this last year. It's like, yeah, who, like, stop making stuff up. And I don't believe that the only person who said that in 2018 we got an offer for the two-pick was Benjamin Albright, who's a known liar, who had to delete like six years of tweets because he's just a known liar, lying about stupid stuff, like his family being a NASA and stuff. Um, but anyways, I but if we if there's a trade, man, I would love to get it. I would love to get it. And I love – and that's why, like, we don't really get into like, oh, we need to get this GM because, like, we're kind of just guessing. But that's why Ed Dodds from the Colts does intrigue me. Um, Cause I, I have loved the way the Colts have went about their business the past few years. So yeah, absolutely. Like they traded down, got play, people, got guys in certain places. And then this past two years, like, all right, we're going, we'll spend 20, you know, they weren't like Pat, they weren't like uh, heavy spenders in free agency originally. And Colts fans were mad. Like why we have 80 mil in cap are using it. Use it the next year. You know, you go get a QB after luck goes down. Um, you trade your first round pick for um, Armstead. I like what the uh, I, I like what the Colts have done. Now, yeah. just because you're next to um, what's their GM's names, um, Chris Ballard, doesn't mean you're a good GM. So that's my thing of like that's why I'll never bang on the table for like we got to get this guy because just because yeah. just because Ed Dodge is an executive, be under Chris Ballard doesn't mean he's Chris Ballard. So that's you know I mean look at Jerry Reese compared to Ernie Acorsi. Um, you know, anyways. I, I it's a off. miracle. It's a miracle that the Colts have been able to stay relatively competitive and it's and this year they are in it. They are competitive when their franchise quarterback and arguably a guy that was on a very, very good career trajectory if it wasn't for injuries. It's amazing that they've been able to stay in it these last couple of years and not totally just lose it. Because most franchises would. Yeah. So good good on them. Um All right, next enter- question. Enter name here at enter name here 33. Even though we'll likely have a top five pick, what are your thoughts of trading for Patriots corner Stefan Gilmore with the second round pick from this year? No. Sorry, enter name here. You usually ask some nice questions, but no. Sorry. Yeah. He's he's 30 years old. That's my thing. And he's at a corner at a position where guys do drop off after 30. Um, it'd be tempting because like we have Gilmore and Bradbury. But uh, I, I, I agree that it's, he's 30 years old. I, I want to be uh, yeah. down with that. And that's just something late. And then you can move off from him. Well, let's see. Actually, let me hold on. Let's look at something. Now, we're not going to, we can't, we're not going to give him a first or a second round pick for him. So it's, it's dumb to look at it. But say he was available for a third round. Let's look at his contract. Let's see how much his dead cap there is. Um, and honestly, Adam Thielen is someone I would look at if they're giving away for like fifth, sixth, but they're not giving away. Um, no. Oh, my gosh. He has 20. Uh, next year, he has. Oh, yeah. His contract's almost fully get guaranteed. He has 24 million. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at 2019. I'm an idiot. Oh, his contract expires after 2021. Eh, maybe. Nuts. I don't know. 
if they did, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's smart. But if they did it, I wouldn't be like, what are we doing? I'd be like, I'd, I would be excited about having Stephen Gilmore on my team is what I'm saying. Stefan Gilmore. We have we have two additional mailback questions. Um, they 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 can be. Did we say Josh S to start the show for one of the Patreon members? I think we did. Josh Solomon. He was he, he's a he's a Patreon member. Did we not yeah, mention pa- him? No, I hope we did. Um, because I failed to give him a shout out because he's the host of the, of the Giant Take podcast. I was an emergency co host of the Giant Take podcast. Um, this past weekend. So thanks for having me on. I love those guys. Yeah, they're great. I, I love them. The, the way that they do inter- interviews, they they always compliment you. And that that and because I have a big ego, that makes me feel really good. Um, anyone we get from a trade this season? So I'm get you know I'm, they're asking if we get anybody from a trade. I would say you just alluded to ooh, Adam Thielen. If we're giving up a if we're giving a fifth round pick, I would say no. I don't think we're going to be buying. No, yeah, I don't think it happens. I don't think it happens. Um. Uh, and then this is all, this can also be a quick one. David Tabell, David Tabelli at David Tabelli two. The He's sad the truth chat. is, Oh, the sad truth is we are probably going to get a top five pick. I'm anti drafting a quarterback, but what's your take? If we get a top five pick as of right now, we're both anti draft uh, drafting a quarterback, but, but we also haven't done our research. So cut us a break. Yeah. Um, We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. All right, and we got one more voicemail to finish it off. Oh, did you not listen to this one? There was one voicemail that we got that was completely. Oh, I listened. I'm play. I just played it. Dead oh. air. Eleven seconds of nothing. Coward. You are a coward. Four seven five area code. Um, <laughs> speak, speak. Freaking cowards, man. No prank calls lately. I haven't put it on Instagram because Instagram blows it up. Um, because it's it's funny. Like at one point we're like, man, we don't get any voicemails now. It's like we can't put the, we can't really advertise this a ton because it'll get blown up. Um, yeah, but but I do want let's give, give us some prank calls. You know, I love prank calls. Give us some freaking prank calls. Is what I'm is basically what I'm saying. I agree. I agree. That's some good ones. Um, the the poo poo pee pee. I mean that was all right. Mm. But, I mean, gotta get gotta get a little better. Mm. Um, what do you want to do? Base, baseball's on, or have you watched any of the World Series games? Yes, I've been paying attention. I did not watch the Saturday. I I went to sleep on the Saturday night though. I was hanging with the friend, and I and I saw everything on unravel on my phone. Um, Raise up one zero. Raise up. Would that be oh, fun? Cool. Game Game Seven would be fun. Who's starting for the Dodgers tonight? Is it Bueller or is it somebody else? Wood. Oh, so I think then they're saving Bueller for tomorrow or for Game Seven. So then he's on regular rest. I just I hope, hope Clayton Kershaw comes in and gives up a home run because I love oh, wow. the. You're, play, you're, I love the. He sucks in the playoff stuff. Like, I you're, love you're, that. You're cynical. People are like, ah, actually, it's like no. He has sucked in the playoffs. Yes, he's had like. A decent ERA at times, but overall, Clayton Kershaw has not been good in the playoffs. He has not lived up to what his expectations are for the playoffs. So stop this like, well, actually, no. Clayton Kershaw chokes in the playoffs. Hope the Dodgers lose three out of four. I really do. I hope the Dodgers freaking lose. I'm actively rooting against the Dodgers. And I want Tampa to be title town. Oh, that would be so fun. And we don't even get to celebrate it down here. Um all right, so I mean, is there anything else you want to talk about? No, no. Um, vote for us. Vote or for don't us. Vote at all. We're not looking forward to the Monday night game. We're not. I'm not. Um, it's going to be bad. I don't know, man. Something about playing Brady Jones some, against the Bucks. Just something about it. <laughs> Chris Godwin out. If we can get some guys back healthy, I mean, it's not the craziest thing in the world, Justin. <laughs> we're gonna three field goals think about their offense wasn't the issue you know their offense scored basically every drive against us last year so they can't really play better than they did last year on offense oh that's true it's true you know what i'm saying oh i i know exactly what you're saying get to brady he's not gonna hey the qbs we've had success against are the ones who stay in the pocket like golf um like brady is not getting outside the pocket you know what i'm saying 
So the same game plan that you have for Pat Mahomes, you need to have for Tom Brady. Keep him in the pocket. No. <laughs> what I'm saying is Brady stays in the pocket. You don't need to make an effort to keep him in the pocket. That's what I'm saying. Oh. Like okay. Goff. Like Goff, we didn't need to make a crazy effort to keep Goff in the pocket, you know? Like all with, right, let's like, end this. Like with Wentz, it was like Wentz, you do all this stuff, and he just goes out and makes these crazy plays. Where Brady's just not going to do that. That's been our weakness is when the play breaks down. Let's end it. I think we're going to win. I do. Sorry. Sorry. No Janoris Jenkins this year, even though I do like you, Janoris. That's a show. That's a show. That's a show. We're going to be Tampa, and we're going to be – we're going to – we're going to be – we're gonna be we're gonna be back on Friday for a pregame show. I'm, I'm, my, my ass gonna be hyped. My ass gonna be hyped, boy. All right, we appreciate you guys. Leave a rating and review. This is probably the worst time to ask for it. Is a Wednesday show after a Thursday mm-hmm. game at the very end of the yep. podcast. Yep. But if you're listening, leave a freaking review. We never ask for them. Leave a leave a damn review. You hear that? All right. We'll see you guys. We appreciate you. Let's go big blue.